Um, hi, um, it's great to be here. I guess um, oh, it sparked a lot of ideas for me, all these presentations. Um, I guess I'm speaking for um, young people who are, I suppose, your next workforce. Um, not the current one, well, actually, usually the current one as well. Uh, and also when we were talking about um, fatigue, it made me think about the fact that they're, they're the ones who have all the energy as well, um, certainly compared to me. So um, a lot of opportunity. So Andrew and I are from the School of Psychology at CSU, and Andrew actually couldn't be here today, um, although I think he's online. Um, his um, daughter currently has COVID. He probably imminently has COVID. Um, couldn't be here. But we both have a background in working with young people, um, usually on social justice issues, and giving them more voice and control. And uh, this project aims to give rural young Australians who are disproportionately affected in some ways by climate disaster, uh, voice in conversations around climate change, climate disaster, and give them a space to take some action. And I should just mention it's um, the project I'm describing today is funded by um, Sustainability CSU, a small um, grant from them. Uh, the art side of things is really new to Andrew and I. We're not um, professional artists by any means. So Claire, we're very fortunate to have um, engaged um, Claire, our partner, who is an artist, runs art classes in Wagga, and has a background in working creatively with young people on issues that they face uh, to creatively express about those issues. And you can see a small exhibition over there. And today I'm going to give you a bit of background to the project, how we set it up, and then I'm going to go through some of that art and talk a bit about what young people said about the disaster that they experienced. And at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about our experiences working in community and with organisations, uh, much more related to community engagement um, and what was communicated about disaster resilience. So um, this is um, a little bit of background on the Snowy Valleys and Batlow, which is where the project was located geographically. Uh, you might really be very familiar with this information, or less so, so it may, might be too much information here. And, um, and hopefully these images are okay and not too upsetting, and tried to select things that were um, appropriate. Um, so Snowy Valleys, New South Wales region, it's a small, uh, well actually it's a very large geographical area, but it's a small community, but low has uh, 1,270 population roughly, and Snowy Valleys is about 14 and a half. Um, thousand people. So it's quite a small um, community in, um, relatively. And um, in relation to the context of the bushfire event, the Black Summer fire, um, the Duns Road fire is the one that we're referring to and hopefully I'll have my facts correct. Uh, there's a lot of experts here so it's pretty intimidating and I'm not an expert in uh, bushfire disaster and I'm, I'm aware that there is sometimes incorrect or conflicting information so hopefully this is all accurate. Um, this fire started the 27th of December, east of Tarkota, so a bit further away, um, and it went, it was officially out the 24th of February, so long period, um, but it was um, very early January, 3rd and 4th of January, that it was Batlow was directly affected. Um, and that's some of the descriptions of what happened in, in ba the Batlow town itself. Um, Snowy Valleys was really broadly affected as well. Um, so a life lost in, in Batlow, uh, 20 properties, um, logging forests, a lot of logging plantation um, uh, doesn't do very well at all with Australian bushfires. Um, so a lot of those very uh, permanently damaged and um, paddocks as well and livestock and of course um, a little, very very we all know large number of um, wild animals on native forest um, and it's also of course as we've talked today important to note that COVID exploded right afterwards so 24th of February and uh, I looked up today uh, schools were closed by the 30th of March so uh, very um, as we've been saying massive overlap so we have got experience of working with young people in communities and we wanted to engage in some creative expression uh, with young people. Felt like that was a good way for young people to engage. It's also an interesting way to engage around uh, disaster and climate issues. Um, 
So we designed these art workshops, and I'm not going to talk too much about the research methodology side. I'm talking more about this as a project today, but there is a research aspect to this. Um, but we designed these art workshops, and it was I and Claire that attended each workshop. Claire was the artist who designed um, the program of art and activities and things, and I was there as a person who's good at working with young people, hopefully, uh, asking questions and helping them think about their express what things meant for them um, I certainly specialize in kind of meaning and interpretation we had uh, six uh, four three to four hours long workshops this was in 2022 I should also add so two years after the bushfires this wasn't intended to be something um, during a disaster probably could have been a little bit sooner had COVID not um, uh, exploded our understandings of time um, but yeah, certainly for a while after, with ages 12 to 18, the young people were. And we were at the, that's the only pic good picture I could get, but the, the Resilience Hub in Batlow. So I'll talk a bit more about that later, but a, um, one of those keystone, crucial organisations in the community um, we worked at their building. Um, small group of young people took part, small community, so sort of eight young people took part, and those young people were really committed to um, art making. And some of them were really committed, well, actually, they were all really committed to raising awareness of their community and bushfire impacts. Um, and some of them were um, really committed to issues around climate change as well. So I'm gonna go through some of the art and uh, some of the young people, because we did interviews at the end of this, um, series of workshops with them so did some qualitative interviews as well so the things that you see that are sort of quotes and there's some quotes littered around the art as well um, are from those interviews um, one of the things that came up that was important was um, talk a little bit later about the different opinions young people had in that community about climate change and disasters and causes of disasters, but one thing that they had um, that connected them very much was how much young people are connected uh, in rural areas to the outdoors and nature. Um, they all had very, very strong connections with nature and the outdoors. That's an opportunity for resilience and um, sustainability. Um, it's also a way in which they're, dis they're very heavily affected by disaster. Um, one of the ways. Uh, but yeah, they knew local knowledge about plants and animals and they spend a lot of time outside, as those quotes describe. So, um, a bit more of the art and some of the quotes. People were asked to evacuate Batlow on the 3rd of January. Um, but there were, I think a couple of other people mentioned that, there were a lot of stresses leading up to that day. A lot of um, expectation of something building beforehand and uh, stresses leading up. So there weren't, a lot of the young people were not doing their normal holiday things. Um, they, normally most of them would go camping. It's a beautiful area. Um, so they wouldn't actually travel that far from where they live and they'd camp in the bush and nobody was doing that at the time. Um, these um, embers in the backyard, you know, lots of putting out small fires before the really, really big stuff happened. So that kind of build up. And then obviously the huge fire, um, these young people were very close to and had some really, really eventful experiences. Um, as some of those quotes describe and some of the um, descriptions, the print there, um, that's for Tilly represent, uh, Tilly's print represents um, lots of pine plantation in um, that area. And as I said, it doesn't do well with fire. And uh, you get this phenomenon that's quite um, uh, powerful to look at, but um, the trunk of the pine bends in the heat and the force of the heat um, and the sap. Um, it looks pretty crazy when you see it. You actually can't see these images very well. You have to go see them over there. They're a bit clearer. Um, None of these young people lost homes or lost loved ones. So that's really important to explain the particularness of this group. Um, uh, it, but actually what's quite important to note is that at the time they did not know that they were gonna not lose homes or loved ones and um, actually had some family members stay behind, didn't know about those family members. Um, heard media reports of their properties actually being lost. So there were points where people did believe they'd lost homes and families and that sort of stress. 
And the other thing to mention about this slide is um, that middle quote about not being able to breathe, and that speaks to the health impacts that young people are disproportionately affected by. Um, these young people had issues with asthma and um, lung problems for months after the event, and um, in flood um, situations, the mould, and that affects developing lungs. So developing bodies are disproportionately affected by the health consequences of climate disaster. Um, with those family members, one of the aspects of young people's lives in a disaster is a similar feature of their lives in general. Um, they don't have as much control over what's happening. Obviously, none of us have, um, lots of us feel like we don't have control over um, uh, bushfires and floods and things, but um, less control over where they're being located or taken to and less control over where family members are going. So they might not choose for some family members to go home and fight the fire or stay behind. They might have chosen for those family members to come with them and they might not have much choice about why they're, where they are. Um, so there's this um, loss of control that's quite hard for young people um, and no control, not, you know, less control over adults' decisions. But that's not to say young people don't have any influence over um, the community or their families. I mean, the fact that young people or in families actually create, creates very different behaviour from those adults. They're not going to take as many risks, um, they're going to get out, they're going to look after their family and that sort of responsibility. So just existing means that they have some influence. Um, but they also displayed lots of ways in which they're very integral and important members of the community and families. Um, and so some examples here of um, influence being there for family and friends. Um, one of the young people talking about cheering up their family members. They might be caring for younger um, children while adult members are having to move around a lot. Um, so lots of ways in which they um, are actually really integral people at that time. Um, also in this sort of period that happens with the, all these sorts of disasters is um, often um, possessions and people um, getting very compacted into one house or a house nearby or aunt's house, auntie's house or their house all the members are coming to because it's safer. So this dis displacement into cramped conditions is quite stressful for everybody. And the young people talked about um, that being difficult and a bit stressful. Um, they also described that being a space for growth. So that's the other thing that... Um, we often forget in discourses around disaster um, to focus uh, where the right context text and the right support exists, there's a lot of growth possible. Um, so um, this uh, quote here says, um, although it was a really bad situation, it was good to think we were all together. I think it brought us all closer together. Putting it in a positive again, I guess, it brought us all closer together and made us that we're all going through the same thing. And that's something that gets a little overlooked sometimes. How am I doing? Very badly for time. Um, and respite was the other thing that came up there, that um, they described ways in which they were able to find some respite from those cramped spaces. Going to stay with friends for a couple of nights who weren't being affected, those friends' families taking them out for dinner, um, distractions, things like that. That seemed very important. Um... I haven't got a label for that over there. I've misplaced the label, but this um, uh, image it was a really powerful one about Batlow. And um, this young person really wanted to communicate carefully to people how much they appreciated what happened in their community um, and strongly about telling this story and wanted to show gratitude to people who fought the fires and saved the town. Um, because Batlow was declared in the press and declared to um, the population there as being undefendable at the time. And that was very, very upsetting for people. Um, but uh, in the event, it was largely saved. Of course, there were some losses, um, massive losses in native land, of course, but local RFS and volunteers stayed behind. And the real uh, monument that stands at the entrance to Batlow is a series of telegraph poles that were burnt in the fires and it's got the undefendable with the un crossed out and I thought that was a really really powerful image and message which we're finding a lot with these pieces of art 
Um, the last little thing about the art is the climate change. Um, young people had really, really varied views on climate change, very reflective of community, I suppose. Some of it uh, was um, very stereotypical ideas that we tend to think lots of rural people have. We tend to overemphasize the idea that that's not a connectedness to nature, which is not the case, or that there can't be some um, similarity and, and connection between two very varied opinions. I might move on a bit because I've got lots of other things to talk about. So the aim of this project was to give the young people some agency and control over how people perceive fires, the rural community, and to some extent climate change. And it's not the only way to take action by any means. And um, it wouldn't necessarily be the right design for an intervention that might be happening right after disaster. This was quite some time after. It tended to be very informal and led by the young people. We wouldn't do it without, you know, we wouldn't make them talk about something, but they were open to talk about quite sensitive issues and they felt able to discuss them. And that might not have been the case um, right after an event. Um, young people are crucial to rural community and to the longevity of communities and they need to find their needs met in rural communities and that's harder and harder um, today. Um, perhaps um, that thing we talk about, um, you know, modern employment industry and agriculture has had an impact on the size of communities and what exists in communities and there might be sport to play but there might not be other activities for young people to do or progression of their lives um, in community and it's hard for them to stay. Um, now, what can I skip to? Practical terms of the needs they had. Yeah, so um, the other practical aspect of disaster that I would say to the people here listening is that respite space. I think that came out as a surprise to me that they told me that I didn't know about, that if young people um, right after a disaster had a safe space to go that's not their home or wherever it is they're staying, that families would feel um, that they knew where they were and that they were safe, where they could be just engaging in some art or some activity that takes their mind off things and gives them a space, but maybe would have access to formal services as well. That would be, to me, that would be an ideal. Now, we were um, very much outsiders to this community. We're two hours away, which seems close, but not at all. Um, very much outsiders. And um, at, that needed to happen because those services that we were able to provide didn't exist in that community. Um, so we, we need to be able to go in. Um, but, and we went in about a total of 10 days over a year. That's quite intensive compared to a lot of projects, but we still had lots of issues engaging with the community and it still wasn't enough. We're not from that community. Val described that a bit. I thought that was very similar. Uh, where I'm not from the community, it's hard. Uh, incredibly difficult to get young people to attend. Always, that's always the case. And so that was a big challenge. And, um, uh, the really key members of the community that we worked with and engaged with were absolutely vital for us to be able to be appropriately in that community. Um, at Resilience Hub, Resilience Hub in Batlow is run by a lady who's from Batlow and I'm not sure that she was doing anything like that work before she came into that role, but she absolutely brings the community together. She's just one of those people that you meet who does everything in that community and she uh, should be financially supported to do so by the government because it's just so vital. These anecdotal things are things that she and others in the community shared to us. So this is not part of our research, but I thought it was relevant to people here today. Um, and a couple of things that haven't come up that I think are really worth discussing. Things that exist before a disaster that are already an issue. The map here of, um, sorry, I'll have to move away from the microphone. But, well, in fact, you can just see the little neon blue dot is Batlow on the map side. And the red stuff is levels of disadvantage. Um, so um, measured in, in the... Um, Australian statistical stuff. Um, I don't want to go into that too much. You can tell I'm not a statistician. Um, but you can see sort of that's kind of a, a very, very visual for this project appropriately and unfortunately in red as well for kind of bushfire related reasons. Um, that it already had high levels of disadvantage um, and marginalisation before a disaster came along. And the community pointed out that that was 
compounding and that was an issue and that that needed addressing not just when a disaster happens or preparing for a disaster but a lot of communities are disproportionately affected by disaster and it's not uh, a coincidence that they also experience levels of disadvantage we build poorer communities in poorer environments on floodplains uh, you know that, that there, there is a correlation there and that's an issue that needs to be addressed very uncoordinated agencies entering and leaving, I'm one of them, uh, and some inequitable and ineffective spending. There are still people who don't, don't have homes in Batlow three years after the fire. Um, there's some buildings that were built that seem very boxy and, and not very warm and, and, and weren't probably what the community needed. Um, yeah, and that way in which community life, again, that needs to happen uh, outside of the idea of disaster that quality community life in rural, rural communities is currently a challenge. Um, yeah, very, I know I've run out of time, but very anecdotally, um, they were talking about the uh, Snowy Hydro. I don't know if you know of the Snowy Hydro. Huge operation, creating lots of jobs in that community. Um, but what happens at the moment, for Batlow at least, is that people leave the community and are put in accommodation, and it's an hour and a half away, so to them that's very, you know, to anyone that's very far, that's people leaving the community. So there's an idea that Snowy Hydro produces jobs for a community, but actually, and lots of people come from outside, of course. Uh, yeah, they're actually a bit cynical about the extent to which that, apart from, you know, environmental questions as well. But yeah, there, there's, there's, you know, ways in which, um, yeah, quality of life is a challenge for rural communities and that that needs to be in, in included in dis discussions of disaster that's i think that's yeah that's me thank you